Yeah. Do you start with Mangala Chan Prabhu typically or yeah. do you start with Mangala Chan? Okay. okay. Do Mangala Charan. Mangala Charan. Okay. Good. All right. May I start? Yes. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Narayanam Namaskrityam. Naram Chaiva Narutamam. Devim Saraswatim Vyasam. Tato Jayam Mudiraye. Nashta Praeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavate Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishthiki Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena As my Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupam Kada Mahiyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vajip Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Amsa Jeevam Sadvaitam Sabat Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye 
पतिताभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधारा श्रीवासादी गौरभक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा हरे रामा हरे हरे Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to um, read and discuss Sri Mad Bhagavatam, Canto uh, Two, Cant sorry, Third Canto, Chapter Four, Verse Number One. So I'll read, and um, and then we can go on. Everyone can read them. Okay. So again, chapter Chapter Four, okay. Verse One. Yeah. Canto Three, Chapter Canto four, Three, one. Chapter Four, okay. Text One. Okay. उद्धव उवाच अथ ते तुज्ञाता पीवा च वारुणि तया बिंब्रषित दुरुक्त मर्म पिस्पृशु उद्धव उवाच अथ ते तुज्ञाता पीवा च वारुणि तया बिभ्रंशित दुरुक्त मर्म पुस्पृशु उद्धव उवाच अथ ते तुज्ञाता पीवा च वारुणि तया बिभ्रंशित दुरुक्त मर्म पुस्पृशु स्पृश उद्धवाच <laughs> ज्ञान उद्धव उवाच उद्धव सैद अथा 
thereafter, te, de, the Yadavas, tat, by the Brahmanas, anugyataha, being permitted, Bhuktva, after partaking, Pitva, drinking, Cha, and Varunim, liquor, Taya, by that, Vibramshita Gyanaha, being bereft of knowledge, Zurukte with harsh words, Marma, the core of the heart, Pasprishuhu, touched. Translation Thereafter, all of them, the descendants of Rishni and Boja, being permitted by the Brahmanas, partook of the remnants of Prasad and also drank liquor made of rice. By drinking, they all became delirious and bereft of knowledge. They touched the core of each other's hearts with harsh words. Purport. In ceremonies, when Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are sumptuously fed, the host partakes of the remnants of foodstuff after the guest has given permission. So the descendants of Rishni and Bhoja formally took permission from the Brahmanas and ate the prepared foodstuff. Kshatriyas are permitted to drink at certain occasions. So they all drank a kind of light liquor made of rice. By such drinking, they became delirious and bereft of sense. So much so that they forgot their relationship with one another and used harsh words, which touched the core of course of each other's hearts. Drinking is so harmful that even such a highly cultured family becomes affected by intoxication and can forget themselves in a drunken state. The descendants of Vrishni and Bhoja were not expected to forget themselves in this way, but by the will of the Supreme it happened, and thus they became harsh towards one another. Mm -hmm. so my obeisances to my spiritual master has opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my obeisances to Chandra Prabhupada for his blessings and guidance. And I offer my obeisances to all of you that, uh, that we can approach this verse, unpack it, and try to understand it from multiple perspectives. Um, as I read this verse, I think one of the things that becomes um, immediately clear to me is that uh, this is a very subtle verse mm -hmm. because they spoke harsh words and which touched the core of their hearts and, and, their, and um, all of us who have taken the seminars um, on entire understanding, one of the things that we talk about is how to touch the hearts of the people through feedback, you know, understanding. So today we are seeing an example of um, using harsh words and what happens. So anyway, we'll start with unpacking the verse little by little. So one of the first things that stands out to me as I read this verse, well, first of all, I would like to set up the context. Um, this verse is being, um, the chapter, the name of the chapter is Vidura approaches Maitreya. So Vidura, uh, Vidura is a, is a sage, wise person, wise counsel in the Mahabharata. Vidura was, who were the brothers of Vidura? Can, it, can anybody tell me who were the other? Dhritarashtra, exactly, and Pandu. So Vidura was the third um, brother. He was born um, through a maid servant. And so Vidura was not part of the royal lineage. Dhritarashtra had his sons, uh, Duryodhana, Rishasana, and the Kauravas. And Pandu had his sons, the Pandavas. And then the third son was Vidura, who was born from a maid servant. There's an entire story, and the father of, can anyone tell me who's the father of Vidura? Yes, yes. Vyasadev, the person who wrote Srimad Bhagavatam Aracharya. And there's an entire story in the Mahabharata about how these Amba and Ambalika couldn't become pregnant uh, by their husbands. And, and as a result, Vyasadev had to go there. And then one of the ladies, she sent a maid servant in, on her behalf. And as a result, Vidura was born. But Vidura was wise, very wise counsel. And so Vidura uh, was telling, this is, the Mahabharata war is bubbling at this point. All the events are taking place. And uh, Vidura tells Vitrashtra that, that your son is the cause, uh, would be the cause of destruction of the entire dynasty. So please tell him to stop what he's doing. He is atheistic. He does not believe in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is not acting according to Dharma. And he has taken up the land and the property that does not belong to him. So you should immediately banish him. 
Dhritarashtra, because he was so blinded by family of, of, of affection and attachment, he couldn't do that. So Vidura leaves. He is disrespected by Duryodhana. And we look at that verse actually, because that's a, another example of speaking harsh words and how to take harsh words. So uh, Vidura leaves, ends up leaving the kingdom, and he travels. And during his travels, he meets multiple sages. He meets Uddhava. So in the previous verses, in the previous chapters, Vidura on his travel sees Uddhava, Krishna's friend, and then Uddhava is talking about it. And then he and he approaches the sage Maitreya after um, Uddhava says that you should go and ask all these questions and inquire from sage Maitreya because that is the tradition of, of gaining spiritual wisdom is we seek sages and we seek spiritual teachers who can enlighten us. And so Vidura approaches sage Maitreya and so the approach, the, their conversations happens after the fact. Here, Uddhava is still speaking. He's st st speaking about how, what happens between the, the dynasty of Krishna, how did they leave? And this is where this verse comes up, that he's discussing that after the Mahabharata war ends, Krishna has ruled over Dwarka. And, um, and now it's time, now the time has come for Krishna to leave. And at that time, Krishna's family is this, the Yadavas and the Vrishnis, and there was no way for them um, to leave the planet. So Krishna conceives all this plan. And that would be my major, major part of the conversation is to understand the reasons of why it happened in the first place. And so, so that's the context. Vrishnis, they fought amongst each other. The reason even is here. What happened was they were invited by the Brahmanas. They performed a sacrifice. And in the sacrifice, they took the remnants of Prasad. And they also drank liquor made of rice. Kshatriyas are permitted um, to, to drink in appropriate occasions and to eat meat because of the nature of their work and because of their activities. It's not permitted to do for the sake of gratification, but it's a meant of um, celebration for, for, for Kshatriyas. So, so they, they, drink, they drank and as a result of the drinking, they became delirious and bereft of knowledge. And then they started speaking harsh words. And as a result, which resulted in a huge fight and they ended up killing each other and the entire clan was vanished and destroyed by each other. So, so a few things, first of all, in the verse, by just by cursorily looking at the words that stand out to me is that they asked being permitted by the Brahmanas. So, so this is part of a tradition that, um, that any sacrifice, any activity that was done in the Vedic times was you have to get the permission of the Brahmanas. You get to get the permission of the Brahmanas. <laughs> that the Brahmanas are, are um, the, the brains of the society and, and they are the ones who can think, who, who have the wise counsel. So, so the Kshatriyas, they still followed the tradition. So they, they, they took their permission to take the prasad and they took the permission to drink the liquor also, which is interesting because in the present time, Anybody can go to a Walmart and buy liquor and get it. Nobody goes to a Brahmana to get the permission. So, exactly. so it reveals that even in engaging in a wise, they were still um, following the tradition of asking for wise counsel. So that's one thing that stood out to me. Uh, the other thing was they took the remnants of prasad. They didn't cook for themselves and engage in gratification. They took the remnants. They were offered to the Brahmana. So it's very clear that Again, um, that the Brahmanas um, are considered to be the mouths of Lord Vishnu through which the Lord eats, because the Lord is the fire in the stomach, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. So it's through the Brahmin's mouth Krishna eats, and when something is being touched by their mouth and being eaten by others, then it becomes prasad, it becomes something that transforms. The Sanskrit word for prasad is sometimes uchishta, it, it transforms the consciousness actually just by eating it. Um, the other thing that stands out to me was um, Varunim. The word Varunim refers to the, the liquor. And there's another famous personality actually in the tradition who is known for drinking Varunim. Can anyone tell me who's that? Lord Balram. Lord Balram actually, so much so that um, that's one of his consorts is actually considered as Varuni. His main consort is Revati, but his other consort, his wife, is considered Varuni, which is essentially the, the liquor, the alcohol that Lord Balram used to consume. And he would consume it in ecstasy and he would sway back and forth and chant Krishna's name. And it is described that he would appear like a white mad elephant just walking on the street. Sometimes uh, I've seen videos of elephants causing havoc and, and just going swaying and not realizing where they are. They said that elephants, when they see humans, a lot of hormones get released in their body and 
the elephants become kind of intoxicated. They think that humans are cute. The experience that we get when we see puppies is the experience that elephants get when they see humans. So they think that we are little puppies. Right? That's why they, and I would recommend watching some baby elephant videos sometimes. You'll see what I'm talking about. So the idea being that Lord Balram is referred to as white elephant at times, mad elephant who just sways and drinks. And, and Lord Nityananda is also described in the same terms. So white elephant walking on the streets and just swaying from up there, just mad in the ecstasy. So much so that he doesn't even care what he's eating, what he's drinking, what he's wearing. Um, and, and there are instances of Lord Nityananda not wearing any clothes and showing up to Srivas Thakur's house. And Srivas Angan living like that in the house and people telling him, that please wear something and, and you would not even understand. He was so mad after the ecstasy of Krishna consciousness. So, so that's why that's the reference that's given. So Varunim is the same liquor that was offered as prasad and that was consumed by these people. Um, the other thing is the effects of drinking. The other thing that stands out to me in this verse is effects of drinking, which is that they became delirious and bereft of knowledge. And um, delirium is an interesting choice of word, actually, by Srila Prabhupada. The Sanskrit is vibram sitakyana, which is uh, one word. But Prabhupada has translated it into delirium and bereft, bereft of knowledge. And so delirium um, essentially means forgetful, forgetfulness and forgetfulness of, the, of our identity, forgetfulness of who we are. And there is a second level of forgetfulness that happens here. First of all, these Vrishnis are jivas. They have forgotten that. And then the second level of forgetfulness happens and they forget that they are with their brothers and they are with their friends. And so this delirium is, is an effect of, of drinking. And then second is they became bereft of knowledge. They were, there was no knowledge left. They had no idea how to act with Brahmanas. They had no idea how to deal with their elders. And as a result, what ends up happening, they, their consciousness got covered and um, they, they started what to do. They touched the core of each other's hearts with harsh words. And so their consciousness, which is already so corrupted at that point, that anything that comes from the corrupted level of consciousness was harmful for others. And as a result, uh, when the, the it is said marma hataha, marma. So marma literally means the core of the heart, the source. The, mm -hmm. We say that in the heart of our hearts, Krishna lives. So marma, the, another phrase, another usage of that word marma is, is the essence of something, marma. So the, the core of their hearts, I mean, imagine the harsh words that they spoke, even in their delirium, that it, it pierced their, their delirium and it went into their heart and it corrupted their heart. And as a result, they end up fighting with each other. And so um, it, 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 it makes me think about um, the importance of speech, the importance of speech, that how um, speech reflects consciousness and what we say essentially represents who, what we are thinking and who we are. And, and here it reveals that, um, that when we are completely connected with Krishna, when we are fully 100% in connection with Krishna in our actual identity, that anything that comes out of our mouth becomes Mukhya Prasad, Srila Prabhupada writes, that the words themselves become Prasad, just how we take partake mm -hmm. Prasad, the words become Prasad and they transform our consciousness. However, when it's covered by multiple le levels, multiple layers of consciousness, then the words are not as effective. And then we're completely covered in a in a tamasic state, in a negative state of consciousness, then they can cause harm, then they can cause damage to the society. Um, <clears throat> so these are the few things that stand out to me as I read the words. Now, um, this is interesting because we are talking about Vidura, right? Vidura is hearing this. Now in verse, in chapter one of this canto, verse number 16, there's a very similar verse actually that happens between Duryodhana and Vidura, as I was as I was talking about. So let's read the translation of that verse. So third canto, chapter one, verse 16. Translation, thus being pierced by arrows through his ears and afflicted to the core of his heart, Vidura placed his bow on the door, placed his bow on the door and quit his brother's palace. He was not sorry for he considered the acts of the external energy to be the supreme. So Vidura has experienced something similar what, what's being described here. So what happened there was that Vidura was telling the Tritrashtra that teach your son the ways of dharma so that he does not deviate and doesn't cause the destruction. And Duryodhana starts asking, who has asked you to come here? He asked Vidura, you are a son of a mistress. How dare you speak like that to me? 
And then, um, and then it's actually in the previous few verses, we can see Duryodhana says, who asked him to come here? The son of a kept mistress. He is so crooked that he spies in the interest of the enemy against those on whose support he has grown up. Toss him out of the palace immediately and leave him with only his breath. And that's the words that Duryodhana used actually. And he's, he's denigrating, he's, he's insulting Vidura that, that you grew up on our, on our subsistence and you are a son of a mistress. How dare you speak like this to me? Just go with your breath. And we see how Vidura receives those words. So there's an important point in, in foundational course we talk about the, the, the sender and the receiver and the message and how it gets perceived and and the importance of the consciousness of the receiver here, actually, Vidura was in such high consciousness that the words pierced his heart, yet he was not sorry. He was aware that, that Duryodhana is a fool overcome by his modes of material nature. And he, quite, he quietly left. He understood the role of the external energy. However, on the other hand, we see these Vrishnis, they were at such a lower consciousness that they got immediately agitated by that, by those harsh words. So it reveals the idea of receiving words. When we fully understand someone, there's another, our role of consciousness becomes also important in how we are taking those words. Yes, there would be affliction in the heart of Vidura, but there was no reaction on his behalf. His reaction was to understand that this person is, fool, is foolish. The person is not knowing what they're talking about. So he follows the wise counsel and leaves. Um, the example that comes to my mind is of Lord Balram, that when Lord Balram saw that the battle was happening and, and things were being said, he just casually left and he got, went on a pilgrimage. My teachers sometimes say that when we don't know in our life when things are so confusing, where things are, people are fighting against each other, when we have no refuge, we don't know what to do, it's best to go on a pilgrimage at that point, like Vidura does, like Lord Balram did. So Vidura understood that that this person is not, there's no point in engaging in a conversation with this person. So he was not sorry, he understood. It's complete in his heart and he left. The Vrishnis on the other hand, when they started hearing harsh words, they started in a fight and they ended up killing each other. So Vidura's response was great. He decided to focus on his own growth, actually. Mm -hmm. he, he focused on his growth and, and, and he traveled. Um, the other verse that comes to my mind actually is from this same canto, second, uh, second chapter and 10th verse. There also it, it talks about how to receive harsh words and what happens, how, do, how should we receive when somebody's telling us harsh words. Uh, third canto, second chapter, 10th verse. So if we go to 10th verse. Under no circumstances can the words of persons bewildered by the illusory energy of the Lord deviate the intelligence of those who are completely surrendered souls. Mm -hmm. That reveals how Vidura received those words. That no, under no circumstances Vidura got bewildered. He knew that the person in front of him is speaking through the illusory energy of the Lord. But since he was a completely surrendered soul, he was not deviated by it. He was not afflicted by it. It reveals the level of his consciousness. Now, um, now, the, the main part of the conversation that I want to focus about is, is the cause of why this war happened, why this fight happened, why were they drinking in the first place, and how could they speak harsh words when they were associates of Krishna? They were not even associates, they were his sons, they were his colleagues, they were his friends. Krishna is purified goodness completely, the source of all purified goodness. So if somebody comes in, his, in contact with him, how can they speak and how can they go into this delirium? And so the last time when I came, when I spoke in this Sangha was the appearance day of Lord Varaha. Mm -hmm. And at that time I talked about that there are causes. There is an immediate cause and then there is a root cause. There's an ultimate cause of why something happens. Um, so these causes play a role and, and Krishna is a master at that. Krishna is crooked. So he doesn't do things straight, doesn't do things straightforward. He has a cause behind a cause, behind a cause, and behind a cause. And that's why in the Bhagavatam, the word sometimes that is used is Rasayan Shastra. This is like a laboratory for acharyas, for people. 
where they, they understand the nuances of Krishna's words and his moods and his feelings and why did he say this and why did he say that. And our entire lineage actually, going back to all the Acharyas, they all have discovered multiple meanings and references. And this is like a laboratory for them because they discover and they create new understanding and they reveal more and more of what Krishna does. So I want to shed light on some of these layers as to why this fight happened and what we can learn from it. And as I was thinking about these causes, I was reading and researching, I could find around 21 different reasons as to why Krishna and the Rishnis fought actually. And there are layers upon layers. And, and so I would like to focus the conversation on that. So the immediate cause, the, the absolute immediate, and this is also a reflection to the world actually of how we see something happening immediately and how there are reasons and causes and multiple levels of seeing things. So the absolute immediate cause, if we just look at it, is alcoholism. Why the fight happened? Oh, they drank alcohol and they fight. Makes sense. Um, now, why did they drink alcohol? Why? And as, as we go on. So in multiple places, it is written that uh, to reduce the burden of the planet Earth. Uh, we talk, Prabhupada talks about it. Multiple places, it is given that, that the burden of the Earth, the miscreants came and caused so much burden and so much nonsense on the planet that the burden had to be reduced. And that's why the battle of Kurukshetra happened and Krishna does his way where by doing one thing, he accomplishes multiple missions and multiple purposes. So he gathered all of the miscreants in one place and killed them all in one place. And that was Krishna's way of handling it in one place. It is also described that these Rishnis were burdens on the planet. However, Srila Prabhupada has given a nuance of what kind of burden they were. I would like to read a quick purport from the third canto, third chapter and verse 14. In the last part of that purport, Srila Prabhupada writes what kind of burdens these were. So in verse 14, uh, 3, 3, 14, oops, 3, 3. Yeah. So Prabhupada writes in that verse that sometimes people say that the population of the earth, as it increases, it burdens Mother Earth. And Prabhupada quashes that idea completely. He says that there are more living entities than humans. And there can be infinite number of living entities present on the planet Earth and the Earth wouldn't be burdened. He says that the burden on the Earth happens because there are miscreants, because their intentionality changes from serving and living in harmony to causing damage and to self-service. Mm -hmm. That's where Earth becomes burdened. Otherwise, the Earth has the capacity to serve infinite beings. Prabhupada says there is adequate arrangement or food for every single living entity on the planet. And there is more and more that can come. So Prabhupada is talking actually about abundance consciousness, that there's enough for everybody on the planet and even more living entities can come and they would be served. The problem happens when the miscreants come. And so this, in, this increase in population is not a burden. The burden is the increase of miscreants misusing these resources. So some Acharyas have said that these Vrishnis were a burden on the planet. But Srila Prabhupada writes actually, it's in the last, last uh, paragraph of the purport, Prabhupada says, therefore, although there may be an increase, great increase in population on the surface of the earth, if the people are exactly in line with God consciousness and are not miscreants, such a burden on the earth is a source of pleasure for her. There are two kinds of burdens. There is the burden of the beast and the burden of love. Mm -hmm. The burden of the beast is unbearable, but the burden of love is a source of pleasure. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti describes the burden of love very practically. He says that the burden of the husband on the young wife, the burden of the child on the lap of the mother, and the burden of wealth on the businessman, although actually burdens from the viewpoint of heaviness are sources of pleasure. And in the absence of such burdensome, burdensome objects, one may feel the burden of separation, which is heavier to bear than the actual burden of love. When Lord Krishna referred to the burden of the Yadu dynasty on this earth, he referred to something different than the burden of the beast. The large numbers of family members born of Lord Krishna is counted to some millions and were certainly a great increase in the population of the earth. But because all of them were expansions of the Lord himself by his transcendental plenary expansions, they were source of great pleasure for the earth. When the Lord referred to them in, the, in connection with the burden of the earth, he had in mind their imminent disappearance from the earth. All the members of the family of Lord Krishna were incarnations of different demigods, and they were to disappear from the surface of the earth along with the Lord. When he referred to the unbearable heaviness on the earth in connection with the Yadu dynasty, he was referring to the burden of their separation. 
Srila Jiva Goswami confirms this inference. So when he says that they were burdened, they were actually a burden of separation. When this great living entities, when this great Jiva, they leave, that the burden actually that was there. And that's the burden when Krishna is talking about. So they were not actually burdened. Now, now to look at all the, all the various causes as to why. So we discussed that there is alcoholism that was the cause. The second reason was that he, Krishna wanted to take away not as burdens of these, but as burdens of the as separation. That's the burden that the earth was carrying because of them. Now, the other reason why um, the Vrishnis fought, well, the Vrishnis were uh, Krishna's friends. They were they were undefeatable by any other means. There was no way, there was nobody on the planet that could defeat the Vrishnis. So Krishna had to conceive a way so that they could fight amongst each other. And as a result, Krishna conceived this way where they ended up drinking. And how they end up drinking is, is, uh, is a story where um, the Vrishnis, um, they played a trick on Ramnas. There was this great sacrifice that happens. And so the reason why they engaged in alcoholism and why they drank was because the Vrishnis were performing a sacrifice. In the, during the sacrifice, when the sages went to the river, um, they disguised their friend Samba, the daughter of Jambavati, one of Krishna's wife, as a woman and as a pregnant woman. And they put some, uh, they, they disguised him as a pregnant woman. And they asked the sages that, can, oh dear sages, can you tell us what kind of child would be born? And this is a man disguised by these Krishnis who were playing a trick on the sages. And the sages could immediately tell. They said that an iron, you fool, you have tricked us. An iron lump would be brought, born out of it. And they freaked out. And immediately, they opened Samba's clothes and an iron lump fell out of it. And, and they, they got afraid about what to do with that iron lump. So they immediately go and they asked Ugrasena. They didn't even consult Krishna. They asked Ugrasena, the king of the dynasty. And Ugrasena said that ground it into powder and flush it in the ocean. And so they ground that powder that came from the body of Samba and flushed it into the ocean. Now see how Krishna's causes work. As they grounded it and flushed it into the ocean, few fishes ate that powder. And then the powder started growing inside the body of the fish. And the rest of it came on the ocean and got mixed with seeds of canes and they became canes. And there was a, there was a hunter, hunter named Jara walking there. And then he saw these canes growing and he realized that these are very strong canes. I could make some nice arrow out of it. And at the same time, a fish came across the ocean. And then he, as he was cutting the fish, an iron lump came out of that fish and he made the arrow out of that. And that's the arrow that was used that, through which Krishna left his body and Krishna left the planet actually. So how one action led to the other, other action and how it led to a series of consequences which ended up resulting because of this curse and then this curse was enacted by them drinking and, and then fighting with each other. So, so a few lessons come to my mind here. First is, yes, they were indefeatable. They were needed to be defeated. Second, they were trying to trick Brahmanas. They were trying to trick uh, Acharyas. There was Narada. There was great sages who were present there. And if you try to trick these great sages, then their words will, will have real consequences for us. So we should never play jokes and tricks with, with Acharyas. And, and we should be serious. This is a lesson in seriousness. This is a lesson in... Um, in um, Srila Prabhupada, actually Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur writes about this point that, that, that there would be Sahajiyas who would come and who would disguise this woman and who would try to trick Acharyas and who would try to play humbly and act humbly. And this is actually a commentary on those. And that's why Krishna performed these pastimes in a way that they learned to, to enact properly and to behave properly in front of Acharyas. Because if they try to act like a woman, dress up like a woman and say that we are having higher rasas, but in actuality, it's they are not giving birth to bhakti. They are giving birth to iron lump, which ends up taking Krishna away from the planet, actually. So, so the being a prakritya sahaji or, or artificially impersonating somebody or artificially dealing with acharyas is a, and all of our acharyas actually write about. So this was one of the major points that happened that, that we learned from this. Um, the other reason why Krishna took them away was because the words of the devotees were powerful. The brahmana said that, that because you tricked us, a lump of iron will be produced and your entire dynasty will be vanquished. So Krishna says that Paritrana and Sadhana, he comes to protect the devotees and, and Name Bhakti Pranashti, my devotees never perish and the words of my devotee never perishes. And Krishna was upholding the words of his devotees. As a result, he's willing to destroy his own family just so that he can 
keep the words of the word of his devotees accountable. Another reason why Krishna um, Krishna uh, kills his own family is that when someone makes fun of Vaishnavas, then they get destroyed, they get killed. Um, Jiva Goswami gives another perspective of why the Rishnis fought and killed each other. He says that uh, these Rishnis, their life and soul was Krishna. They, 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 they saw Krishna in the morning, they saw Krishna during the day. So Krishna's disappearance before their disappearance would have made them mad and agitated. And in Krishna's absence, they would have destroyed the earth, actually. So Krishna decided to wrap them up before they could get to that point. Sridhar Swami describes that um, he uses a word called Bahubi when he describes how this curse was played. And he says that this curse was actually not the work of Krishna himself, but the four armed form of Krishna, because it's, it's Narayana, because they were all demigods. They were all coming from heavenly planets and they were all um, Vishnu Tattva. So as a result, they were, they were taken up by that. Um, in first canto of Srimad Bhagavad, Srimad Prabhupada writes that this is the Yadu dynasty is like the sun and it, it disappears and it appears. And similarly, the, the entire dynasty, it's, it's seeming disappearance, but they are taking birth in another planet where Krishna is moving and performing his pastimes. And after the sun sets, Prabhupada writes that there's some darkness. And that's the darkness that happens when an Acharya leaves or when a dynasty leaves. And as a result, when, when this was happening, this, this fight started to happen and the entire earth was in chaos. It's because of the passing of this sun. Um, a very important point um, that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada writes here and, and very el eloquently mentioned by Bhakti Vikas Maharaj in his book, Sri Bhakti Siddhanta, we have a highly recommended reading on the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He recommends, he writes that one of the core reasons why Krishna killed the Yadus is because to teach that the family is not equal to the Lord. And, um, and he gives the example that, that later on, Mayavadis would come and they would equate that somebody who lives with Krishna is equal to Krishna. That these Yadus are as good as Krishna because they, they live with Krishna, so we should worship the Yadus. And which causes Mayava that anyone who comes with touch with Krishna becomes like Krishna, becomes Krishna. So to vanquish Mayavad actually is the reason why Krishna killed all these years. That's another reason why it happened. And there's another even more reason, and it has a connection with Gaurli as to why Krishna killed his, his people. Um, to, 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 to explicate on this further point, that the actual Vaishnava lineage, the actual tradition is not dependent on the family. It doesn't come through a family lineage. We see it very prevalent, prevalent today in Vrindavan and in Mayapur and other, other places where are there are these big Goswami temples. And it's an entire family blood lineage. And, and nobody can take initiation except people born in that blood lineage. And that's how the lineage continues. And Krishna killed his entire family for this exact reason, that a pure devotee and acharya is self effigent and they are all on the planet and they'll keep coming and they may not be the part of family. And so Krishna consciousness is not limited to one family or blood relations. And uh, we, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada writes about the example of Advaita Acharya, Nityananda Prabhu and Mahaprabhu. All three of them are Vishnu Tattvas. All three of them, they, they renounced their family. Mahaprabhu didn't even have sons. So he completely wanted to set the example that Krishna consciousness is not dependent on family lineage. Advaita Acharya had a son named um, Achyutananda. He had a few sons who fell away, who didn't even follow Krishna consciousness. Achyutananda was, was his son, but Achyutananda had no sons after, that, after him. So the family lineage didn't go. And Lord Nityan Prabhu had a son named Virabhadra, Virabhadra Ram. So Virabhadra, uh, uh, he didn't accept any of his sons. He didn't accept his sons as Acharyas. So the point that is given here, Srila Prabhupada, we see it in the life of Srila Prabhupada that his sons, his, his, uh, his eldest son disappeared. Nobody knows where he went, Prayagraj. His, his second son and his third son, Vindavan Chandra, when Srila Prabhupada passed away, they, they created a lawsuit against his corner and against Prabhupada and they wanted the entire property in their own name and they had no merit. And it was revealed again by Srila Prabhupada that how family lineage is not the way that Prabhupada's son becomes the next Acharya. It, it happens in the life of the entire Nityananda Pariva that we see today that have tried to do it to keep things within their lineage and, and fights have happened and branches have come out. So Krishna did this because um, he wanted to prove that the family 
is not the only way or is the way to propagate his teachings. It's through self-effulgent acharyas and jivas who come and take to pure devotional service. Some people say that it is Krishna's desire why this happens and there's no conclusion, no discussion after that. Krishna decided to kill it. And that's a reason good enough actually and we should be okay with it. Um, some people say that um, Krishna came to kill them so that they could be re-established in the heavenly planets. And some people, uh, some acharyas have argued that um, that people may end up worshipping Kamsa because of the same reason that he was part of the family of Krishna. So we should do what Kamsa does. So, so Krishna gets a better family that no, the examples are by Acharyas. They should set the example of those. Uh, there's a verse from uh, Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu in this regard that, that is very, that, uh, that comes to my mind. Shruti Smriti Puranadi Pancharatra Vidim Bina Ekantaki Hare Bhaktir Utpatita Kalpate. That if one wants to one wants to demonstrate his great devotion to the Supreme Lord, but his process of devotional service violates the standard rules of revealed scriptures such as Shruti, Smriti, Purana, Narat, Pancharatra, then his alleged love of Godhead will simply disturb the society by misleading people from the auspicious path of spiritual advancement. So the path, we may say that we are lovers of God, but if we are not following the Pancharatra Vidhi, if we are not following the, the tradition that was given by Acharya then our love, maybe just alleged love, and this will misguide people actually. And, and this is said because um, Samba was dressed as a female and was being humble that I'm so humble, I'm so servant of God, and please tell me what my child would be born, just to prove this point, and that's what Rupa Goswami writes, that because they didn't follow the tradition, they misguided the society and their entire society, society died. Um, Nal Kuvera and Mani Kriva played a silly prank with Narada Muni and as a result they became trees and they were liberated by Krishna. So similarly when these guys played a prank with Krishna, they all got vanquished and killed. So we should not play prank with, with, with the Supremes. They are also, it also depicts the four vices that we deal with. Brahm, Pramad, Karan, Patva and Vipralipsa, the tendency to, to make mistakes, the tendency to to be in illusion, the tendency to have imperfect senses and the tendency to cheat. All four of these things were exhibited by the Yadu boys actually. So Krishna is teaching that we are all, that not even his family is, um, is not even his family is free from the impacts of material nature. And even his family could be subject to those things and, and he will do justice with them. He will kill them. And, and the final reason why, why, why they, they ended up they could have salvaged themselves. They made a mistake. They pranked the Acharyas. A lump was born. It was meant to destroy their dynasty. They were afraid to speak to Krishna at that point. They could have gone to Krishna and they could have admitted their mistake that we tried to impersonate. They avoided Krishna completely and they went to go to Ugrasena. And as a result, because of not acknowledging and not admitting the cause of their mistakes, and uh, not being accountable for their mistakes, they ended up causing a chain reaction which would, which would come in and destroy themselves. So um, Mark Twain once said that it is better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open and remove all doubts. Um, <laughs> so, so this is the example that um, they should have kept their mouth uh, quiet instead of revealing themselves as fool first in front of Acharyas and then with each other and piercing their hearts. One of the first things that Rupa Goswami tells in Ugrisham with his watch awakam is to control the tongue, control what comes out of the tongue. And, uh, and we see that because of not that watch awakam, not following that, that tendency, um, they ended up killing each other and, and they ended up destroying the entire thing, so entire mm -hmm. lineage. So to conclude, uh, Vidura uh, approaches and asks this question, Vidura was also re received harsh words, but Vidura handled it very well. His consciousness was at such a higher level that despite being affected by it, he did not feel sorry. He did not carry any resentment. He did not carry any victim consciousness to himself. And Vidura understood, and he did what was appropriate at that time and that moment. The Vrishnis, not so much. They, they, kill, they end up killing themselves. Krishna does it for a number of reasons. Krishna, these people were not burdened on the planet. They were actually burden of love. And there are 21 reasons we saw why Krishna decided to do things this way. And when Krishna does one thing, he does multiple number of things, like the story of Akshapatra, when Krishna does one thing, everything else gets satisfied because he's come. He's, he's the expression of pure goodness. He is pure goodness. So when he does something, it automatically satisfies everything and every jiva and everything that he does is so perfect in his action. 
And, and as a result, when we become pure and when we come closer to Krishna consciousness, then like Srila Prabhupada did one thing, but by his one action, one movement, all so many people on the planet get got benefited. And his one word can transform them, uh, transform people's consciousness. So the Acharya, the words of a powerful Acharya can transform our, our consciousness. Just one word has to be said. The story of Aindra Prabhu comes to my mind that when Aindra Prabhu, the great Kirtaniya from Vrindavan, led the 24 hour Kirtan for ages. He only had one interaction with Srila Prabhupada. And uh, one time he was in the DC temple and he was playing his Mridanga. And, and he was standing and playing his Mridanga. And Srila Prabhupada came over. And in his heart, he was thinking that this is my service. This is what I need to do. He was doing book distribution. He was working. He was doing a number of things. And Prabhupada happened to walk there. And Prabhupada, he looks at Prabhupada. And Prabhupada looks at him and Prabhupada says, Jai. And that's all the conversation was. But just that word of Srila Prabhupada transformed that he felt it as a validation for his service of life and he established the 24 hour kirtan. Until this day, the 24 hour kirtan in Vrindavan is, is ongoing. It has not stopped for years now. So, how the word of a powerful Acharya can transform our hearts and how the words of uh, someone else who's not in the right consciousness can pierce and can cause the suffering. So, um, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I would like to open the forum for any questions, thoughts, comments, any other examples of harsh words from Shastra, which has <laughs> caused damage from personal life, please. Uh, is anyone online? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, thank you for your service. Like you mentioned, about it, I really appreciated that the contrast between the Dora hearing the harsh words and the number sneeze in regard to Dora Milan, but uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus on the cross, I pre forgive them, they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. So that, that for me, it, it, it came to heart when you described the, the Dora's mentality. Mm -hmm. it, that, that, uh, yeah, so he experienced the hurt, experienced the hard words, but uh, he didn't develop. And animosity. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's uh, and the, 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 the verses you wrote. And that came to mind. I appreciated your thorough, comprehensive, practically exhaustive yeah. <laughs> discussion of the of the multi uh, multi reasons uh, behind the disappearance of the Yadu dynasty and how come it happened the way it did. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's. It's complex. It's not really confusing, but like, oh, but uh, it's, there's complexity. So mm -hmm. I got, uh, I just got a fuller understanding from your class. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That's the quote by Jesus is, is very excellent, actually, that you have the same. And, and we can see the world of an Acharya, actually, Jesus being that Acharya, his consciousness mm -hmm. not being affected. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful class. I really like the burden of the beast and burden of love. Mm. And I was wondering if you could, I didn't fully understand why the Rishis were a burden of love instead of the burden. And what exactly is the burden of beast? I, didn't, I, I got the example of burden of love, parenting, all these things. What is burden of beast? What is that? What Prabhupada means by that? The burden of beast, um, thank you for your question. I think the burden of beast, uh, the point is that anybody who, um, is simply a burden and there's no reciprocation, there's no love out of it. It's mm -hmm. it's exploitation. Mm -hmm. That's the burden of, of beast. For example, Kamsa and all these people, they were, they were a burden of beast. They the devotees wanted to live happily in Vrindavan, and Kamsa kept sending demons after demons after demons. And so these are the burden of beasts, actually. Um, the atheistic mentality in the planet, on the planet that wants to exploit. Um, this week, as we were talking earlier, that this week in the world, pretty amazing things have happened, actually, if you've been following it. Um, the entire takeover of Twitter happened for $44 billion. Elon Musk took over Twitter. And the value is now... That he bought the company Twitter for $44 billion. Twitter. And now its value is $8 billion in two weeks. So he grounded the company, lost $36 billion in one week in two weeks and the company got lost one of the biggest cryptocurrency uh, marketplaces yesterday became bankrupt destroying the bi billions of dollars that people invested in it so um, so these are the burdens of beasts actually on the planet they want to suck the money out of the planet and greed there's enough for everyone and 
but this is the burden of beast and the vrishni is being the burden of love being the point that the vrishnis are described as a burden in some places that krishna comes to reduce the burden of the planet so some people argue that he he killed all of the demons on the battlefield of kurukshetra and then he killed the vrishnis because they were also a burden so prabhupada is saying that they are a burden but not the bird not burden of beast they are actually a burden of love that krishna first of all having them on the planet and then killing them it's, it's a burden of love actually for him first because there's a burden of separation that's going to come with it and the fact that they have to die till this way mm-hmm. that's the burden of love that krishna prabhupada is talking about so they are a burden but not the burden we understand that's the nuance that mm-hmm. involves them yeah. as opposed to like uh, the those are the clues exactly they were agreeing with you so yeah often. exactly yeah okay. I kind of like to wonder about things, and there's not a lot of information about exactly what was said, like to sort of be there, really be there and, and hear what this one said to this one and try to understand. You know, we know that hurtful things were said, mm. we relate, mm. we've experienced hurtful things in our life. Mm. Um, that people have said, or maybe even things we've said and, and, and regret. But it, it would be really interesting to know exactly what what was said, and just also looking at the the influences of sort of like uh, not really saying where people are because they could be transcendental, but in the sense of the modes of material nature, like the blockage of communication. I mean, it's really upset with the connection. It's not like they had this really bad night and the next day were like, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I said these things. You know, it, they didn't enter into any like healing communication process. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the way it was meant to go. Mm-hmm. But and and then what was said by everybody, you know, just sort of, you know, contrasting, you know, the Dura, who was more clearly, you know, in goodness and transcendence, mm. transcendence in just a totally different way. Um, you know, there's a path of destruction, a path of enlightenment. Mm. You know. But I just feel like you like you just presented so much. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, oh, yes. that was a great class. It's just like, what did you just do to me? I mean, like, <laughs> the process of class for weeks now. <laughs> thank you that that was um as i was telling you last night as i i was thinking what to speak on today and i looked at this verse and this verse verse really speaks about communication oh i forgot to mention one thing actually krishna talks about the ideal speech in the 17th chapter of bhagavad gita mm-hmm. he says what kind of speech is ideal it's pleasing it's beneficial to others and it's not agitating that's the austerity of speech to be able to speak in that manner and pleasing sometimes i was struggling with that word pleasing because you know sometimes we give feedback to each other especially in satvato it's not pleasing it's not meant to be pleasing it's meant to grow that person and then i looked at the sanskrit word and it's the it's the word is pre it's dear mm. so we speak words that are dear so pleasing may, may the, the connotation may have become weird later on when roba wrote it wasn't as bad but today we understand people pleasers and pleasing words so You, we speak words that are dear actually and the dear words are which which will help them grow in their consciousness which will help them understand so that's the level of speech that should be there actually that krishna establishes a standard for communication and speech and here you're right I, i'm curious to what was said and and in ways there are some pastimes there are some books from dwarka where this could be understood mm. people perform dwarka pastimes actually because when this happens it can be seen sometimes you know how they speak um there are examples from shastras when when harsh words have been spoken and people have taken it to their hearts uh, lord shiva's example mm-hmm. numerous stories of lord shiva you know numerous he, i think it's in the third canto yeah the, the entire story of daksha actually of yeah. how it was said that don't told his wife don't go there he'll speak words that will agitate your mind and, and she goes there and as a result the entire fight happened so So yeah, they have real consequences, and it really um, is a testimony to to the point that words become reality. Words become manifestation, cause manifestation of real things in life. So, so what we say is is very important, and it shapes our consciousness, and that's why it's a reflection of our consciousness. So, 
to, to repeat things that are not true about ourselves ends up causing that, that thing and ends up causing a future. And then as Ms. Prabhu talks about um, that um, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will dictate your life and you'll call it fate. And this unconscious, he unconsciously speaks certain things. So oh, I was like that and I'm that. And it, it becomes true. It becomes true. They carry meanings and they carry power and they carry seeds actually. Our entire tradition is based on this philosophy of planting a word in our hearts, which becomes the Mahamantra and chants and purifies ourselves. So the entire source of it, the first in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And Lord Brahma, Lord Krishna spoke from the heart. It's all words. It's all emanating from the words, actually. So the power of words, actually, is a whole different gamut of discussion and topics that can take place. But to, to acknowledge your point that, that words, and, and yes, I did speak a lot because as I started unpacking, there's so much more and more and more and more things started coming. And that's um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada calls it, uh, oh, wait, what is it called? There's a verse in Chaitanya Bhagavad. Krishna Tulya Bhagavata Vibhu Sarvashra Prati Shloke Prati Arte Nana Vakya Koe. So Vrindavan Das Thakur writes that Krishna Tulya Bhagavata, this Bhagavata is Krishna, is comparable to Krishna, Vibhu Sarvashra, it's Vibhu, it's everything, and it's the Ashra, it's the shelter of everyone. Prati Shloke, every Shloka, Prati Akshare, every word, Nana Arte Koe, everything has multiple meanings actually. We just take one word and we can take it so many ways and so many directions and it still doesn't end. That's why we only have 12 cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. In the heavenly planets, there are 64 cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam mm -hmm. because there's so much more, so much understanding. And each Acharya has come and they have given their, their understanding and it keeps on growing yeah. more and more and more. And it's endless. It's, it's endless ocean, actually. The Bhagavatam is endless ocean. It keeps swimming for days and hours and till the time. Mm -hmm. If I may yeah. comment a little bit, yeah. a bit further, as, as I think about the importance of communication and really, you know, trying to not avoid essential communication. So, in one sense, they had these these bad words, and people were hurt, and then there was like you know, cur curses and this, and, and they they tried this process. It was almost a little Haranyakashi coup, like to try to get around something mm. so like oh we're going to beat this by you know get this ground right you know and really is uh, they made the problems worse yeah. the seeds of all these dreams of, uh, of uh, the, 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 you know so it's it's sort of like there's there's less than that and then i think of when not directly here but there's this really beautiful story maybe you can help me remember the personalities involved Relating to one of the ghost farms, where someone was the great devotee was meditating this beautiful past time at Radha Krishna, and somebody else came along and, um, like, maybe spoke or tried to speak and felt they had been like uh, 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 offended. And then this other person woke up uh, or came out of the thing and, and became aware that this other person had come. and they didn't acknowledge, you know, who, who yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they finally just like both together, like found each other and met up, and they're so humble. And you know, it's just so to like destruction versus profound connection, and yeah, love, you know, absolutely. And can you help me remember that? I, I exactly don't recall which yeah. answer it was, if anyone remembers, but I do remember the yeah. last time you're talking about they were meditating and the other person thought that they offended him, that I, I called you, I talked to you, and you didn't respond to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the person was completely in trance and then they met up. So I, I'll, but I can find that out for you. Yeah. It reminds me the example of Parikshit, of how Parikshit got cursed and how he goes to the ashram of sage Rishi Shringer. And, and he goes, or sorry, Samik Rishi, he goes to his ashram and, and the sage is meditating and he says, may I have some water, please? And the sage doesn't respond. Mm -hmm. And so he puts a dead snake just out of anger at that point. And the child curses, the five-year-old Brahmana boy curses. And, and I'll see that that word became cause of a destruction in one sense. And the entire Srimad Bhagavatam came out of that. So how Parikshit, you know, he took those words and he accepted them and embraced them. And again, it's another example of the consciousness of Vidura. To accept and as a result of it, this happened. And same thing, because Vidura accepted those harsh words and continued, this entire Vidura mantra conversation happened. 
I guess there's an there's a lesson here of accepting harsh words and knowing as a doorway for for higher levels of truth to come out and communication to happen. So thank you for sharing that as well. Yeah. When you share we wanted uh Shula Kalpur would sometimes refer to Shula Bhakti Siddhanta giving class every day for three months on the first verse of Bhagavatam. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there are 18,000 verses. So we what the, the Carl Bud was emphasizing that point from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Each each word is so full of meaning. Yeah. And yeah, oh, I'm reading it. So each word is so full of meaning. Not that not that we want to get like neurotically lost, you know, I'm not catching all, you know, we, we want to read along, but just just to be impressed with how how deep each pastime is, each word is. So Prabhupada said in, in that was in, in what is now I think uh, Bangladesh, East East Bengal, mm -hmm. Bhakti Siddhanta every day for three months, just on that from okay, right. start, oh, starting with Om Namo Bhagavad Gita. Then as far as speech, the Anu Begam Kram Bhaktiam Satya Kriya Inam Chaya Svandhya Vyasanam Chaya by my um, Tapuchite. It's an aus the austerity of speech and the integration. Yeah. But it's, it's the austerity, it's sattvic speech, yeah. and and the integration is yeah that it's it's uh, it's true. Yeah. We speak truth yeah. you know, in a in a way that's truly intended to be win win. Yeah. In a way that's truly intended to be beneficial. Yeah. I would say our classic example is is Srila Prabhupada, yeah. right? Like that. Um, Sometimes, even in a first meeting, sometimes he would be so heavy. Mm. He would be so heavy. Mm. And um, like say things that this is not comfortable. Right. This right. is not comfortable. And and in every circumstances, you 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 highlighted the term priya mm. in every circumstance. But somehow, even those who are receiving the heavy, like Prabhupada would share in such a way that it was endeared. Mm. It was endeared. Mm. Like somehow they got <laughs> somehow they got like, like I don't agree with him and I'm not comfortable with it. And I had a different point of view. And no, no, no. But somehow they got like like this person's coming from a pure place in, in his boldness. Mm. So we, we don't want to imitate, but that's that's the principle. Mm. The Prabhupada distinguishes between Anukarana, yeah. uh, 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 just blind imitation and anusharana, you know, mm -hmm. actual following the principle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so it, it's a must because it, it can be easy, as mm -hmm. the saying goes, if we're only ready to do what's easy, mm -hmm. life will be hard. Or mm -hmm. to do what's hard, life will be easy. easy. It can be easy to, oh, I'm just not going to say anything because I'm too scared. Mm -hmm. I'm too scared to, to speak mm -hmm. and more motive ignorance mm -hmm. and then all sorts of. Resentments and withholding yes. fester. Mm. And can somebody can also be it's like, well, here's the truth, here's what I've been in your face, see if you can handle it. Mm. But then okay, when it's actually challenging, mm. you know, for me, mm. it's an austerity. Like, mm. okay, I'm gonna be courageous and, and communicate mm. my true perception, communicate the truth as it is, mm. honest feedback, mm. and truly. Truly be sincere to connect with energy and words where like where I am and others are getting me truly coming from a caring place. Mm -hmm. So that requires like a real meditation. Mm -hmm. It's a sattvic austerity. So I just wanted to follow up on that aspect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you. I think uh, as you are sharing of Prabhupada's example of how he said some things that were so wild. And yet the person got it. Two examples came to my mind, actually. The first is of Alfred Ford, mm -hmm. Prabhu, uh, the great grandson of Henry Ford, heir of the Ford Fortune, you know, lives in Gainesville. He, um, when he first met Srila Prabhupada, they introduced him that in Detroit, you know, his entire family has been there. He bought the beautiful Detroit, the Fisher Mansion, that's a huge temple, temple right now. They introduced him to Prabhupada. The Prabhupada, this is, this is Alfred. He's the great grandson of Henry Ford. And Prabhupada looked at him and, and he could sense that there was some pride in, in the people and then it came in. And, uh, and Prabhupada said, you are the great grandson of Henry Ford. And he said, yes. So Prabhupada responded immediately, where is he now? 
<laughs> and, and immediately his, he writes about it that his consciousness was transformed that oh yeah yeah i i'm carrying something that was there and here is an acharya and, and here i am as a jiva so transformed in just one thing um, another example that comes to my mind is um, i forgot the name of the devotee he used to eat meat and um, he was in france actually there was a class and, and he asked Prabhupada that uh, about meat eating and, and why can't I meet, eat meat and chant Hare Krishna? What's the problem if the mantra is supposed to? And Prabhupada, what's wrong with eating animals? And, and Prabhupada looked at him and that guy, that person came with his sister and Prabhupada said, why don't you eat your sister? Mm. And, and it's a wild statement to hear. Right? And, <laughs> and that person reflected later on, yes, yeah. it's my affection to my sister. I've created this sense of affection. And to animals, they are living entities, and then he talks about it in memories of Prabhupada. So, so Prabhupada had a way of saying things that may seem offensive on the surface. So deep down, they transform their hearts, and because it was coming from the right point, from that highest sattvic consciousness, actually. So, mm -hmm. and so many examples. I mean, I can go on and on on Prabhupada nectar on what Prabhupada said. So, anyway, thank you so much for sharing that. Prabhupada. Very appreciate it. Thanks for the examples. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. yes. Thank you so much for your class, uh, Rasha Sindhu. Yes. Okay, nice. I'm Anna Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Um, Lakshmi Priya um, sent me some pictures signing who you work with. Okay. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, I like so much, and I also feel like my head is going to explode because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty new. But I don't know m much history at all of Krishna's um, family and how he was left the earth. And mm -hmm. so this is like all like very disturbing because <laughs> so, like, there's like so much going on. <laughs> And, um, and it reminded me because we're also studying for Chaitanya Trita at class tomorrow. Mm. And um, like Krishna's called a cheater in, in that particular chapter. And you <laughs> call Krishna a crook. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just like, it's just, it's so, when I talk to new, new people about Krishna consciousness, and, it, and like, I, I dressed up as a gopi during Halloween, but I didn't, of course, call myself a gopi. And so someone did. Um, did express an interest in that more than calling me an Indian princess, which was really sweet. But um, so so I was trying to explain, you know, how the gopis would drop everything, you know, they were with their husbands and they would drop their babies and they would go in the middle of the night and go searching for him. And so in this chapter 19 that we're talking about is that I didn't realize that Krishna like never appeared. Like the gopis were like really still searching and were like heartbroken and you know, I, I have enjoyed for years since then, I think it's course, that um, the, the gopis were these beautiful, you know, um, relations with Krishna, and I was just, like, devastated. I was like, what? <laughs> he cheated the gopis, and then even Radharani, and so, um, but yeah, so it just, it just, it keeps, it keeps me in check, like, you know, like, Krishna's, like, really, um, I have no idea why Krishna does what he does, right? So, and like, so you're saying he's a cause behind a cause behind a cause because it's an experiment. And I'm like, I'm just learning. I'm just, I'm still like learning. It's just like, wow. I mean, I am not, I'm, I'm not the controller. I have no clue what's going to happen. And yet there is, there is, there is a, something behind everything that happens. And, and Krishna is, is, you know, um, He's crooked and he's he's a cheater and I'm like wow so um to describe that as a cheater and a crook this seems kind of far out <laughs> it's just amazing so I'm just like sitting with everything you you've shared and appreciating everything you've shared and I really love your knowledge and um, your easiness of just you know um, like there's there's a calmness there's like there's not this like very I I with my hands and my voice. And you, you're just very calm and, and just, I just, I take it all in. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. First of all, a power pack comment. Thank you for sharing. A <laughs> um, few things that uh, quickly I would like to acknowledge and respond that um, Krishna is crooked. Yes. He says, I'm the gambling of the cheats in the Bhagavad Gita. He's the source of all cheating. He's, he does transcendental cheating, actually. He does transcendental cheating. He comes in the form of that nobody recognizes. He, he cuts up his curl, changes his color, appears, and is, is teaching people how to chant his own name. <laughs> and so, so that you know, the, we heard the parable of the, the snake oil salesman, you know, that's so a Krishna <laughs> does that. He teaches his own name, actually, he comes out 
and he does so much cheating actually it's, it's in the mahabharata war he says that i'm not going to pick up any weapon his devotee desired boom carries the weapon the cheats them cheats the whole, the whole buddha incarnation the whole buddha incarnation yeah so appears as buddha and and, and and him being crooked actually god govind swami one of illustrious disciples of prabhupada writes that krishna is crooked and he's bent you know shamon tribhanga lalitam is bent from three side three ways you know he's crooked so he's all the other acharyas lord ramachandra is straight you know there is krishna is crooked and there's a reason for for his crookedness and thousands of ways acharyas have understood this and one of the ways he says is we want to invite krishna to live in our heart mm-hmm. right so if you imagine um, our heart like a bottle like a circle if you put something straight like a stick the stick straight the strip uh, the stick that is straight it goes in and it comes out but if something is crooked then it mm-hmm. gets stuck in there so the reason krishna is crooked is because we can capture him in our hearts and he won't be able to come out once once we capture him so when we capture him so so numerous examples of krishna being crooked the example of not appearing in front of gopis mm-hmm. and radharani that's one of the most most um, powerful pastimes in krishna consciousness that's the birth of lord chaitanya lord jagannath all the past times all originate from krishna not appearing in the entire mood of separation that mm-hmm. that happens there and and there are ways that he appears and why he doesn't appear and, and it's 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 another ocean of <laughs> of of understanding krishna's moods and his desires and yes there are reasons up to reasons and reasons so mm-hmm. i used to think growing up in india reading the bhagavad gita bhagavatam seeing the deities growing up oh i know when i met the devotees and i think oh i know these things what are you talking about <laughs> i grew up listening to them until such a point came when i realized that oh there's i don't know anything actually there is so much and so many reasons and and we sometimes feel that oh i've read that book or even with small prabhupads books sometimes oh krishna book or or on the way the path of perfection or this oh yeah we have read those books to the point that there's so much more prabhupad used to say that all my ecstasies are in my purpose mm-hmm. and in my books so if you want to see them in our moods of shri prabhupada then and, and then these purposes and these things so and that's what keeps our tradition fresh and going and that's why our tradition is the sankirtan tradition the tradition of scripture the tradition of passing on this knowledge thank you for your feedback and and your praise and, and i'm glad you here i see uh, garuda has his hand up Hare Krishna. Thank you Prabhu for your class. Um I, I just wanted to share brief briefly that um I I was really appreciating your care. Um like really getting how much you cared about uh serving us today giving your class. Um that's that's all I wanted to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my great honor and privilege actually to be able to come and speak in this sangha. I've received a lot from from Prabhu from this sangha, and and it's my honor to to give back and and to share. And this is fun. I mean, it's it it's so much fun actually reading verses and opening. But this is done. Sir, as what you would call it, shastra nipunta. That you read one verse, but then you go to this 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 purport, and and then that book and that book, and just keep going around. And it's so much fun. I I was realizing last night. I finished. I worked till late. you know about the pacific cars i was doing uh, coding processes and sales processes and <laughs> when i got chance to this i said oh my goodness what a, what a breath of fresh air so, uh, that that i have been for hours actually could not stopping so thank you it's my great honor and privilege to be able to share and to be to open something a little part of shrimad bhagavatam so that you can also thank you thank you yeah i really appreciate it And there was so much my my you know when I I was fascinated by what you were saying I just like uh, it was um, thinking of the nectar you were thinking about the ocean of nectar sure. like there was like an ocean of nectar like every world every pastimes you know visiting the Mahabharat go visiting the top Kanto again and going back to Vidura and. and Duryodhana and then looking at the different aspect of the Yadu dynasty and all the burden like like mm-hmm. and, 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 and understanding this first time I I feel I feel the first time I heard about the the destruction of the Yadu dynasty it felt so 
like odd, mm. strange, mm. and um, and since that I've been, you know, like diving into understanding the reason behind it, the call, like you said, there's so many, many reasons mm. for every pastime to take place in a, yeah, that's really beautiful about Krishna consciousness, that all those layers are, are so, um, um, you know, captivating, captivating, and also, and we can understand also in our lives, there are so many layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, hearing from you, it, it, it became even uh, clarifying, crystallizing, okay, so all different aspects of the past time, and why it took place, and yeah, it's, Weird. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very, very, very yeah. weird person. Just the fact of, yeah, you know, just drunk, just that. Yeah. And then that's, yeah, we acting so uncivilized, yeah. <laughs> and beating each other with sticks and killing yeah. each other with yeah. stick, yeah. you know, yeah. balls and arrows. Yeah. And they say that from there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah, that's what Krishna is crooked. He just, he keeps things interesting. He yeah. doesn't do plain, yeah. plain. Lord Ramachandra is called Maryada Purushottam, right? I will do stand up yeah. old and plain and bland. And Krishna makes it interesting and fun. Yeah. And he likes to play tricks and dress up. Yeah. And yeah. I was also thinking like Lord Ram is almost like, un un it's all hard to relate with. He's so like proper and his pastimes are so like, oh, that's it. Perfect. Because yeah. Krishna is like, oh, it's not like it's into fights. Yeah. Like, they're a little more related yeah, right. like, yeah. harsh things. Yeah. Or, yeah. They can be a little extreme, but there's something yeah. kind of like weirdly relatable. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lord Ram and other incarnations, it just seems like, okay, that's just a story to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, like I said, if, if it is, um, the reason, you know, there's so many reasons, but like a relatable because Krishna, you know, Janma, Yasya, Yataha, whatever is in, 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 a, in a effect is in the source. And mm -hmm. so, also the cockiness, the cheating ability, the, the actual, the fighting ability, we have them, and Krishna shows them to us. You know, in, in, in his form as Krishna, or oh, yeah, you know, his work as he show, or oh, like his creation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, like that, we, we see, okay, everything is part of Krishna's creation. Even even the things that we consider, you know, on the dual platform, mm -hmm. but they they are still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I appreciate your point, so in that way. Yeah. yeah. We have the pure form of Shiti, the yeah. pure form of <laughs> of cookiness and the pure form of everything lying. Mm, so lying. See, yeah, <laughs> so nothing see. is off the table, basically. Nothing is <laughs> off the table, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, that's separated from Krishna. No, no, it's not separated from Krishna. Nothing can be separated yeah, from right. Krishna. It's all exists there. Oh, I'm under Rastakam pastime. It's yes. about Krishna as a thief. Krishna as a thief, yeah. And there's Krishna as a coward. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, 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 another kind of story. Oh yeah. So the, we we have all these propensities to be cowardly, to steal, yes, to uh, uh to yeah, cheat, cheat, to to deceive. We have all these propensities. Yeah. So there's the pure source. Yes, and yeah. yes, the source of everything. Yeah. Two things come to my mind. One thing that you said was that Bhakti Siddhanta spoke for three months straight on the first mm -hmm. verse. Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur has many purports on that first verse of Bhagavatam, including a completely rasic purport of the entire Rasa Lila and the entire Krishna Lila in the first verse of Bhagavatam itself. In the first verse, the more you break that. So Krishna being the source of everything, that anything, anything little he does is the source. Right? Anything. And the second thing was him being the source of his cowardliness. Yeah, that's a big one actually. And, <laughs> and him clearing his name when the Shamantaka jewel was stolen. Uh -huh. And Krishna was in the marketplace clearing his name. I didn't steal it. And he was clearing his name out in the marketplace. <laughs> he does it. He's the source. When we say the source of everything, it means everything. I mean, there's, it's everything. Literally everything. Nothing so, left out. Nothing left out. Nothing left out. Yeah. That's all that. All the shadowy parts of human mm -hmm. character, and there's the pure form. The pure form. He referenced Vishnu. Mm -hmm. In Kalpa's purport to the first verse, mm -hmm. which was long purport, yeah. he references 
Vishwanath Chakravarti, of course, reference to pure sex psychology. Mm. And you think, oh, well, that's 10th Canto, mm. it's right there. It's right, right there. there. It's, right there. It's, it's first right there. verse. Right there. Absolutely. Pure sex psychology. Yes. It's right there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the phrase of hidden in plain sight, I think, is what comes up. And it's the same pastimes, actually. Oh, Prahlad Maharaj uh, talks about this. Uh, What's that verse? Adanta Gobir Vishatam Tamishram Puna Puna Charvita Charvana right? That um that the living entities in the planet on this planet they the chew the chew puna puna charvita adanta gobir their senses are wild going wild each chewing the chew taking them to hell taking them to hell and then Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur writes that the same verse applies to the devotees Adanta Gobir Vishatam Tamishram Puna Puna Charvita Charvana we are reading the same verses each and every day, and we are chewing the chew, and we are deriving so many things. Adanta Gobi that our senses are going wild, <laughs> chewing the same verses, chewing the chew. So again, same things applied in so many ways and so many perspectives. It's, it's endless. I, I mean, that's that's why it's such a personal movement. Each acharyas they have their personality, they have their understanding, and they have a personal aspect of their relationship with Krishna, which they reveal through their traditions and through their songs. Mm -hmm. And that's the entire game of personalities, actually. That's what Prabhupada was so heavy against Maya, was making it all homogeneous and making it all the same. Just yeah. a yeah. There's so much uniqueness and variety, and that's the joy that I get from courses also when different people come with their experiences and they have their own transformation, and it's so unique to that person and to their identity and reveals their uniqueness and their connection to Krishna. That and that's why Krishna just enjoys it. It's unlimited jivas. I mean, he didn't create five. I will only create 500 in the first batch or 600. 500. Now, unlimited experiences yes. and unlimited jivas and unlimited pastimes. And doesn't end. And that's, the, that's our eternal life. That's what we are here for. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you very much. What an enlivening sangha. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare